Hello, friends. Welcome to No Cap Room. My name is Dan Devine. I'm a senior NBA writer for Yahoo Sports, and I'm talking to you first this week because my partner, Jake Fisher, is out on assignment, which means that I'm the admiral of the NC Armada this week, and it also means that I need someone else to talk to. So joining me today, proprietor of the Substack, TomTheFinder.com, analytics insider for the Portland Trailblazers broadcast, and now a regular contributor with us here at Yahoo Sports, it is Tom Haberstro. Tom, how are you doing today? I am good. Uh, I have one more ad on that, if I can. Yes, by all means. Plug, plug, plug up top. Yeah, uh, Kevin Arnovitz and I, we do a Top Chef recap pod, and it's called Pack Your Knives. And so if you're listening to this and you're wishing that, oh, uh, if what if two NBA guys could cover Top Chef like it's the NBA? <laughs> I have the podcast for you. So uh, go check that out, packyourknives.com. We, big episode last night, Frank Lloyd Wright. It was it, a lot of stuff happened. So uh, coming off of that too here. That's incredible. Please give my regards to Mr. Arnovitz. It's been too long since I've seen him and talked to him. So that's that's a wonderful addition to the list of plugs. And today we're going to do some more plugging along as we get here towards the very tail end of the 2023-24 NBA regular season, uh, getting ready for the play-in uh, tournament and the postseason. Uh, we're going to talk about who has the most on the line heading into these playoffs. But first, we're going to hit a little bit of news up top. Uh, news came down on Wednesday that Drew Holiday and the Celtics have reportedly reached agreement on a four-year, $135 million extension of his contract. The details, Holiday is going to decline the 2024-25 player option from the deal he signed in Milwaukee. Uh, Would have paid him about $37.4 million next season. He's going to re-up on a deal where the year one salary is about 7% less, saves the Celtics owners a bunch in luxury tax payments next season, but then he's going to get about 98 to $100 million in new money through 2027-28. Um, the deal locks up Boston's entire top eight through next season and keeps the good times rolling in Boston where they've basically lapped the Eastern Conference. Tom, your first reaction to hearing that Drew Holiday is going to stay in Boston for the next few years? He's their Andre Iguodala. That's their guy mm. that they're, you know, as he enters into his late 30s, he's a very cerebral player, multiple positions that he can guard. He had kind of an earlier in his career as the guy for his team and now is going to be their like elder statesman. And it reminded me a lot of Andre Iguodala with the Golden State Warriors is we want to look, Steph's great. Clay's great. Draymond's great. But the guy who kind of makes everything work in between is going to be Drew Holiday, uh, the same way that Andre Godala was for the Warriors. And so, yeah, you might look at this and say, man, they've got another Supermax extension for Jason Tatum on the horizon. Same already inked for Jalen Brown. They've inked uh, Chris Stapps Porzingis to an extension already for a couple more years. These things are starting to add up. But what I like about it is this is what we want our super teams or our title contenders to do is to retain their top talent and go all in. And so Drew Holiday, as just the idea of Drew Holiday, he's older, but so is Andre Iguodala. And I love kind of the symmetry of they were on the Sixers back in the day together. That's right. Um, you know, pre, pre Sam Hankey. And so there's kind of that full circle moment for Drew Holiday. And now Andre Iguodala is the head of the players union who's, you know, arguing for raises for players at this age in their career. So hat, hats off to the players union for trying to find ways that players in their 30s can get these uh these big paydays and you're seeing it here with Drew. Now the questions are can he perform at a high level in the postseason when it matters most? And they're making this extension right now before we can kind of get an answer to that right. question, which is making for good theater. You know, Dan, like they make this this commitment right before we can kind of really understand what Drew Holiday for this Celtics iteration looks like in the postseason. Yeah, and that's I mean we mentioned it last week because uh, Jake Fisher, uh, you know, always gone or gone but not forgotten. Um, Jake had written, uh, gotten some time with Drew uh, last mm. week and wrote a story about it. And we that's really the only lingering question. There is we saw in Milwaukee, he was like a thirty nine point five percent three point shooter in the regular season with the Bucks, and then that went down to like thirty point four percent in the playoffs. And so even during the runs, you know, the the title run, the the offensive game for Drew waned a bit, especially when it came to the jump shot. And so that's going to be a big issue or big something to keep an eye on yeah. here in, in Boston. But th as you mentioned, the difference is the role is so much more circumscribed and the and, and sort of 
it's weirdly, it's, it's incredibly broad in terms of the number of things they have him doing, but it's also more narrowly tailored in a way. Like it's kind of everything all at once, but also through a keyhole. Like <laughs> they, like he is switching so much more than he ever did in Milwaukee under under Bud. He's like playing the centers and in the middle of a matchup zone. He's spending so much more time in the corners than he ever did because he's not running pick and roll as much. He's not isoing as much. He's str- uh, spacing the floor for them. And like all of these boxes that they needed checked, he's checking all of them. Uh, a number that I loved and just started researching it this morning. He has made more corner threes this season than he made in Milwaukee. He has made 55 corner threes this morning. He made four, 54 in three seasons as a buck. Um, and that's the big number. Go ahead. <laughs> I know I'm stepping on the bit. I apologize. We're going to get back <laughs> to the big number in a little bit. Um, but it's just uh, it, you could not possibly ask for more as, from Drew Holiday, the player, for what he's given Boston this regular season. And they, they, it is a team that has built itself into just a ju- regular season juggernaut where everything is going, to, like all will come down to where are they in May and June. And this is obviously a pretty significant vote of confidence in what Drew Holiday can provide uh, on those stages for the Celtics. And now, you know, uh, it's going to cost a pretty penny for them to see it, but uh, they're paying to, to kind of buy their card on the river here and they're going to find out what it turns over. Speaking of teams that are about to be entering postseason play, which is a mind blowing truth given where this franchise has been the last few years, but uh, a pretty wild thing happened on February 13th, 2024. No, it's not just that it was the night before Valentine's Day and men all over our fi- fair land were scrambling for flowers and chocolates and whatever. The Orlando Magic played their first nationally televised game since the 2020 bubble. Wild. <laughs> for the wild. uninitiated, a quick recap on this year's Magic. Uh, they're good. They've been good like all year. They're entering Thursday's games 46 and 34, number two defense in the NBA, according to Cleaning the Glass. Head coach Jamal Mosley, one of the favorites for the Coach of the Year award this season, uh, currently in fifth in the East and still a, they're a game up on the seven seeded Sixers. Projection models still give them anywhere from like a 60 to 80 percent chance of finishing top six, making the playoffs proper, avoiding the play in. And they've got a guy who is the reigning rookie of the year. He has played in almost every game this season. He's improved just about every per game average from last year. He made his first all-star team and is one of the best players on a playoff team. And there's a decent chance that like a lot of the country hasn't watched him play since he was at Duke. Uh, We're talking about uh, Paolo Boncaro here, and uh, he's going to be playing in important playoff games on national TV. So we wanted to offer an opportunity to learn a little bit about Paolo Boncaro. Um, We're going to play a game here, Tom. Imagine you have to describe Paolo Boncaro, the basketball player, to someone who's like familiar with current and recent NBA basketball, but hasn't seen him play. Where is your first sort of point of comparison in doing so? I don't want to steal your thunder here. Uh, Steal away. I got thunderbolts coming out the ass. Don't worry about it. Okay, great. Um, Bad they, sentence. I, Shouldn't have said that. Feel I, guilty I, immediately. I had some visuals here that was just fantastic. And I, I do not take this out of the pod. I, I promise you, <laughs> I will never come back here if you take that out. All right. Um, so Thunderbolt's coming out of your ass, but aside from that. Yes. I think that Blake Griffin is a wonderful comp for uh, for Paolo Bancaro. Felt that when he was at Duke. Um, and a lot of that is just his size and his skill. Um, he doesn't have the same sort of like, he's going to posterize everybody at one point or another. Um, he, for my taste, he settles for a little too many jumpers. Um, but his passing, his dribbling, his vision, um, his physical, um, just sheer power reminds me a lot of Blake Griffin. And I know that you, you've, you see the same same sort of thing, right? Yeah, I kind of tried to thread a little bit of a needle with it because the game reminds me of sort of like Pistons era Blake, where he'd sort of developed his skills and his craft and moved a little bit more toward the perimeter after some of his injuries. But the physicality and athleticism, I mean, it's not the jump out the gym athleticism that you're, as you mentioned with Blake, like there, uh, I have yet to see Paolo Banquero Mozgov somebody, but I certainly am open to the possibility of that happening. I would love to love to see it. Uh, have not used Mozgov as a verb in a few years, so it's good to bring <laughs> yeah. that one back into the lexicon. Um, but the the just like the phys- the sheer physicality and force that he plays with does feel a little bit like young Blake. And so the 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 needle thread for me, maybe like the point of transition that I feel like is maybe an aspirational goal for Paolo's game is like 
remember that it was that 2015 playoffs for Blake. And it's the, that round one where there was like the epic Clippers Spurs series. And then round two, they go and they, they're playing the Rockets and they're up in the series. But then the crazy mm. Corey Brewer, Josh Smith come back and everything goes sort of downhill from there for L.A. But in that postseason, Blake averaged 25.5 points, just under 13 rebounds, seven assists, a steal and a block per game on 51 percent shooting. And I'm like, I remember thinking very vividly, like this is probably about as close as we get to LeBron outside of LeBron. And I kind of feel like if you are, I'm mean, obviously LeBron is a very aspirational point of comparison for anybody. But if you are aiming at an aspirational sort of player type for Paolo Banquero, where huge point forward, able to overwhelm physically, but also an advancing floor mapper and creator off the bounce and playmaker for others with an with a jump shot that you have to respect, like that's kind of what the the idealized version looks like. Whether he ever gets anywhere near that picture, I have no idea. But that that version of Blake made me think of that sort of ceiling. And when you see Ben Carroll at his best, that's kind of the same picture I have in my brain. Okay, so uh, I'm going to give you another picture in your brain. Okay, yes. um, in your head, Detroit Blake Griffin, and then Clippers Blake Griffin. The halfway point between that on the map. Uh, you're just thinking, okay, halfway between. Uh, where is that? Well, I have the answer. Okay, geographically, the answer between where what is the halfway point on the U.S. map between L.A. and Detroit is Julesburg, Colorado. Julesburg, <laughs> Colorado. Um, I, just looking this up at meatways.com. I don't know if this is a real thing or like what kind of, I shouldn't be like endorsing this website, but there is a little thing that says uh, the J and L Cafe in Sterling, Colorado, has four and a half stars on Yelp. So, <laughs> JNL Cafe, if you're in the neighborhood of Julesburg, Colorado, go check it out because you might see Blake Griffin or Paolo Bencaro there because that's in our head. The, the, the midpoint between those two careers is right there in Julesburg, Colorado. So, Dan, um, I'm with you on this, and I'm glad you brought up those numbers and the and the memories because I ran the numbers. I did some research in addition to looking at meatways.com. I went to stathead.com, <laughs> and I wanted to see statistically when you look at Paolo Bancaro through two seasons, what are the comps? And so what I did at the glorious website that is stathead.com, I found Paolo Bancaro's points per 100 possessions, rebounds, and assist rates, um, which is 30 points about 9.8 rebounds and 6.6 .6 assists. So 39 and six. And I kind of lowered the sliders a little bit, dialed it back to, I want to see all the players in their first two seasons average 28, eight and five through their first two seasons. And it spat out a list of eight names. Um, mm. Here are those names. And I'm not saying, I'm not, I didn't do like a, a ceiling on these. So sometimes you're going to get like to 17 rebounds per yeah. 100 possessions. Um, but here are the eight names that, that cross that Paolo Bencaro threshold. You ready for this? Let's hear it. All right. LeBron James, Michael Jordan, okay. Luka Doncic, Wemby, LaMelo Ball, Vince Carter, and Mark Aguirre. Ooh. I, I said Mark Maguire, Mark Aguirre said Mark Maguire. Uh, <laughs> in, different player, different athlete. Um, but Mark Aguirre, in addition to another former Piston, Blake Griffin. You mm. nailed it, Dan. Blake Griffin is also in that category of points, yes. rebounds, and assists. Yes. Uh, statistically, it is a very fair comp for Paolo Bancaro. Mark Aguirre is the first one that I was like, oh, you know what? Those other names, I get it. Uh, passing bigs or at least super skilled like Vince Carter and high flyer. We're talking like some of the best dunkers of all time. Michael Jordan, Vince Carter, LeBron James. Um, so it, it tracks. Mark Aguirre, okay? For those who are uh, listening at home who want to know a little bit, all the all the Gen Z or millennials that don't aren't familiar with his game, uh, I, I pulled up an LA Times a uh, story about Mark Aguirre and uh, and Isaiah Thomas, who grew up next to each other in Chicago. And the reason why I pulled this up, Dan, is because we want to learn about Paolo Bencaro, but we kind of need to know those who blazed the path before Paolo Bencaro to understand the true Paolo Bencaro. So we're going to learn why 
Uh, Mark O'Guire's nicknames on Basketball Reference are Ziggy, the Pillsbury Doughboy, Elephant Drawers, the Muffin Man, and Fat Daddy. Okay. The origins of these nicknames. I'm sorry. Tom, I'm just, I'm so frustrated that now I have to cross every single one of these nicknames off the list for myself. Like now I can no longer ask people and which is really embarrassing when you're asking people to call you something, but like that. So it's, that's most of my list. Elephant drawers. We all want to be named (laughs) elephant drawers. So I'm like, where did these names come from? So I did some more research here. Um, You know, Journalism, I feel like, is waning in today's society. So I feel like we're doing our part here to understand the uh, etymology and the origins of of elephant drawers and the muffin man. So according to the L.A. Times, um, I'm just going to read this um, in, on a story about Mark Aguirre and Isaiah Thomas. Quote, they were bosom basketball buddies. They grew up eight blocks apart on Chicago's seedy west side. To friends and rivals, Aguirre was never called Mark. He was laundry bag, big drawers. <laughs> Doughboy, because of his shape. His own high school coach called him Ziggy the Elephant. Okay? (sighs) It continues. Thomas was the opposite. Uh, A waif, a peanut, a Zeke the Mouse, but he could handle a basketball. At three, he would put on dribbling exhibitions for Our Lady of Sorrows, lead the older boys onto the court before games. Reader's Digest even ran a photograph of little Isaiah doing his act. And then Isaiah says... My first memory of Mark was at Martin Luther King Boys Club. We'd choose up sides, but he wouldn't get chosen. Quote, too fat. Oh, love it. I love this. So we're <laughs> learning that Mark Aguirre, and yeah, he's got a bulky build when he was with the, the Mavs and the Pistons. Yep. Uh, and same thing with Paolo Bencaro is he's a He's a big, beefy dude. And so while we we can't call him Elephant Drawers or Pillsbury Doughboy, because that's already been taken by Mark Aguirre, we can now understand um, that statistically he is the Mark Aguirre of 2024. I love so much about this. I love... uh, First off, the the, the, the body positivity way to frame this is like, so many coaches will tell you that a little extra weight on a player, that's just a potential. All that, that yeah. is is an opportunity to get that guy in better shape. And then you see where, uh, you know, where he is after that. What kind of player is is resulting from that work? I love that Laundry Bag is a nickname that, I mean, I, I might wind up taking that. I know that the, the other ones are off the board, but Laundry Bag, I feel like I might wind up taking because it's not on basketballreference.com. And I also love the framing of just like this is the you know Aguirre's size being something that, ca- that translates over for Paolo because one of my I have some other comps here that are less thought through and more just sort of one line yeah yeah and one of them is thick Tatum <laughs> um, because and part of that is maybe the Duke thing but it's also like stylistically maybe settles for jumpers a little too much but uh you know a tall playmaker who can use his physicality to get his shot when he wants to, when he gets downhill as a handful to deal with. And uh, there is a sort of a smoothness to the game that I was like, if, if you sort of just uh, adjusted the sliders on Tatum's width about, you know, 15 extra percent, you know, you did like the, uh, the sort of uh, stretch and skew in Photoshop yeah. and just yeah. sort of moved it out a little bit, could kind of see that if you squint. Well, uh, I'm glad you said a uh, handful because I forgot one thing about Mark Aguirre. Okay. I don't want you to forget anything about it. I want I want all of it. All right. Coach Meyer, one of his former coaches, said uh, he arrived. He's talking about Mark Aguirre. Uh, he arrived with a pair of hands so large that Coach Meyer memorably described them as big as toilet seats. <laughs> 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 so big as toilet seats. I, I feel like we've lost those kind of similes and metaphors. Like, I always want like 80s and 90s, like but, 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 hey, well, his, his hands over there, they're big as toilet seats. We don't, get, <laughs> we don't get that anymore. We need more of that. Well, I, and I think it's like, because you all of those sorts of things have to be appended with like, a, not in a bad way. It's like, normally <laughs> if you compare somebody's body to toilets, it's like not a great thing. So you have to be like, no, no, no I mean it as a compliment, not an insult. Um, but I, I love you. Yeah, I mean, going past like catcher's mitts or whatever to 
toilet seat incredible absolutely yeah. incredible but you um, but you were saying um you have you have thick tatum and you have more names that or I've one-liners got, let's, I've, got let's hear a, I've got i've got a few more one-liners actually I'm gonna, one of them is like a little bit boring. it's 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 maybe more accurate but it's a little boring it's just bullets chris weber is kind of oh it, but, that's good yeah but my it, there's not a there's not a joke in there it's just bullets chris weber um what if julius randall chilled out a little is yep. one mm-hmm stylistically uh you know but mm-hmm. again you know 20 point score big i mean he doesn't rebound at quite the level you'd want from or that some of these other guys do um but stylistically big bruising i am a point forward i get downhill etc what um, about what about um i thought of this this morning was uh mm-hmm. i wonder if the heliocentric era a lot of players who were kind of back to the basket bigs, but had a lot more skill and finesse um, and could dunk over everybody would be more thought of as kind of this versatile player. Uh, I was thinking about Chris Bosh um, mm. because of his, his silky smooth jumper, uh, his versatility and, you know, Toronto Raptors CB4 Chris Bosh was a monster, right? And he, and he actually literally like beefed up big time in that final season before going to the Miami Heat. I kind of thought of him as like not known as a lockdown defender, but could play the five and it was cerebral enough and skilled enough that if you put the ball in his hands, he's going to make the right play. And so Chris Bosh, while he doesn't have the same physique as, uh, as Paolo Bancaro, I feel like he fits the profile of like way more skilled than just the 20, 25 and 10 guy. Absolutely. And and it's like there's a we thought of him at that point, maybe earlier in his career, like, well, he's like the next Texas big guy like that, like, you know, like Marcus Aldridge, where it's the mid range jumpers. Right. And a lot of mm. and then Bosch was like, there's actually a lot more to me. Like, and not that there wasn't a whole lot to Marcus Aldridge, obviously, but that his game could sort of scale up and scale down and move out to the perimeter in different ways that LaMarcus didn't even sort of sniff until the very sort of like the end of his career in San Antonio. Um, I love that as a like, there's more, if you scratch the surface with this guy, you're going to find more there. I think that that's probably true for Ben Caro. And he's only what, 21 years old. Like we're going to find more as we go along. I think the first playoff series for him is going to reveal a lot about where the league sees you know, the pressure points with him and then how he is able to respond to that as with all great players, you know, you you see how teams guard you when the games matter most and then you have to uh, respond and adjust to that. And that's real. I mean, those are all really smart thoughts. I have some more dumb jokes. Um, Chevy Suburban Pascal Siakam. (laughs) You went with Chevy, not like a GMC Yukon on that one. It's isn't it so weird that like car companies just put out the same car with a different label and hope that no one notices. Like remember <laughs> Dodge Caravans and like Plymouth Voyagers? Like I, my mom had a, a Dodge Caravan and we would just go into this white with the, with the wood paneling side, wood Dodge paneling. Caravan. Yeah. Just classic. Another thing we need to bring back from the eighties and nineties. Um, <laughs> But then, like, you'd see, like, a Plymouth Voyager down the street, and you're like, wait, is that the same car? How did they get away with this? Uh, Chevy Suburban, GMC Yukon, I Pascal Siakam. I feel like it's Chevy Suburban on this one. Great choice here, rather than the other one. Yeah. I, I mean, yeah, you wind up with sort of uh, big Spider-Man pointing at big Spider-Man meme. But, like, yeah, it, it's a, it, again, if you stretch, stretch Pascal about two inches to, uh, high and two inches wide and then uh, ask him to stop spinning as much is kind of what you what we wind up with. Um, second contract, Antoine Walker. So it's not like right when he comes out of Kentucky, but it's like at, and before we get all the way to like I'm taking nine threes a game before that's something that's considered OK, like in that mm. sweet spot, maybe like right before Paul Pierce gets there. I don't know. Like that's kind of where I feel like I could see that. You, you want to hear my favorite Antoine Walker stat? Yes, of course I do, Tom. Okay. Uh, remember that line he had, Dan, that uh, when someone was like, why do you take so many threes? Uh, do you remember what his response was? Because they don't, there aren't any fours. Exactly. Do you, do you, it's, it's like one of my favorite lines of all time. Yeah. Um, so a few years ago, remember when like James Harden was getting all these three shot fouls and like yes. it was a it was a huge talking point in the league, right? Um, and I did this like big profile on just like the evolution of the uh, three shot foul. Um, the player that took the most threes without ever scoring a four pointer. No way, Antoine Walker. Wow, that's like tragic. Yeah, it is, isn't it? Like the guy who said the greatest line of I take so many threes because there are no fours. 
never got to score a four-pointer in his career despite taking so many threes. That's, oh man. Right? I feel like I'm going to have to go like look at a body of water and contemplate existence <laughs> a little bit later, like to find, to find that Antoine Walker had no fours. Like, oh my goodness. Never got <sighs> one. Hey, hey, refs, you know what? If we can, like, look, the Tim Donaghy thing, real bad thing that happened with the league, but right up there on the list, not giving <laughs> Antoine Walker a fouls made three so he can finally get his four. Oh my God. Listen, hope springs eternal. We might need Antoine to get like, I don't know if he, I don't know where he's at in, in, in his journey. Maybe he can get to the big three. I don't know. Maybe he can get on the three, like the three on three uh, team USA. Like, I, we got to get him in the building for one of these opportunities to see if he can get to a four point line. My last one here. All right. And I need you to be with me, Tom. I need you to be with me here. Man, you've been with me this whole pod and I'm going into like toilet hands and uh, Antoine Walker four point line. So, man, I am with you the whole way. I've got four words to wrap us up here. Fever dream, Josh McRoberts. <laughs> Mick Bob, Mick Bob on a fever dream. I love it. Uh, Mick Roberts is uh, another dookie. You've got the Duke connection too. I mean, that was, it's a happy accident, but I'm thinking, I'm like, there was a point where it's like, he's shooting better than people realize. He's got more hops than people realize. Yes. He's a good passer. He's a good rebounder. He's like, he sort of thinks the game real well. I'm like, if there's like a max out, you know, you put you like you hack into the game and you're like, I'm going to bump him up to 99. I'm going to do like all the, get all the VC in 2K and like add up his skill set. Like if you pushed the, I also, I, I kind of wanted to make sure there was a, tra a transracial component to this too. Or I'm like, I don't just want to compare only white guys to black to, to white guys, only black guys to black guys. Can we find like, what is the idealized Josh McRoberts? The idealized Josh McRoberts might be Paolo Banquero. Yeah. And by the way, people forget Josh McRoberts, when he was at Duke, was like the number one prospect. Like he, coming yeah. into Duke, he was like everyone was talking about that. Too. I I want to say, and I'm going to pull it up on Basketball Reference because one thing that's great about Basketball Reference is they have like the the high school recruiting ranks. Right. And yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. 2005. Monte Ellis was number two. Ma Martel Webster was number three. Tyler Hansborough was number four. Lou, uh, Lou Will, of course. Luis Williams here on this list. Uh, Lou Williams was at five. Those were the top five top recruits in that class. Number one, Josh McRoberts. Incredible. And somehow we've gotten in the space of the first like 25 minutes or so of this show to people forget Josh McRoberts was a problem. <laughs> people forget Josh McRoberts is a bucket and people don't know. Um, so kids, listeners out there in the service of providing some context for Paolo Banquero and the playoff or likely playoff potentially play inbound Orlando Magic. We'll see how the next couple of games go. Um, uh, we've now we've given you some context with which to appreciate it. One more thing I want to make sure we appreciate, though, before we move on, we get to an ad break to pay some bills is that while Paolo Boncaro is the all-star on this team, maybe the most important guy on this Magic team is Franz Wagner. And if you note, know, they've lost the last couple of games. They got drilled in the last couple of games. Franz Wagner out with a right ankle sprain. And uh, a couple more big numbers here to talk through. For the season, the Magic are plus six in more than 2,700 minutes with Paolo Boncaro on the floor, plus 188 in just under 2,300 minutes with Franz on the floor. They outscore teams by 12 and a half points per 100 possessions with Franz Wagner on and Paolo Boncaro off. They get outscored by nearly four points per 100 with Paolo on and Franz off. So Paolo's the star and he deserves all the recognition and credit that you know people like us talking about toilet hands and Chevy Suburban, Pascal Siakams will give him. But if you're looking for a player to keep an eye on in terms of the rising and falling fates of the Orlando Magic as we head into the postseason here, keep an eye on Franz Wagner because he's super duper important for them. I feel like uh, there are a lot of these guys that as we go into the postseason here, there's the star, but then there's also like this other injury factor that we are yeah. going to be underlining and circling and saying the legacy about this player, Paolo Bancaro, if they flame out in the first round because Franz just isn't Franz, we should remember that. It's so hard to remember these things because we have, like Homer Simpson, like we just have so many things going into our brains that we just it, inevitably we right. forget it because there's only a finite room up there. I feel like 
there's so much of that this year, that there's injuries across the board, that what we think about with this Orlando Magic team and Paolo Bancaro, I kind of feel like in some ways, I would rather them be like the sixth seed because I feel like the expectation's way too high mm. if they get that second seed. In the same way the Sacramento Kings last year, it felt like they were on the ascent, and it also felt like... Mm, Maybe we're getting a little too ahead of ourselves. And that's how I feel about the Orlando Magic team. Think like long term trajectory wise, I kind of feel like it's healthier for them to be a six seed rather than like as high as a two seed at, at like a week ago. They could have been the two seed. Yeah. It's, and, you know, so much of this is about expectations. Our, our old friend, Paul Flannery, I said, I've invoked this line a number of times on this show and other shows and say the best time you can have in this league is right before you get good. Because once you get good, everyone starts expecting more and more and more. But what, right now, like there's a version of this that's all gravy for the Magic. I mean, they've more than doubled their win total over the last couple of years from two years ago. Like this is a, no one heading into the season expected this. So going into it, yeah, as an underdog in a first round series with an opportunity to you know throw an uppercut at a favorite, that's one thing. But going in as a high seed. Uh, without the experience, without the with the opportunity to wind up sort of falling short and stumbling and then elevating the pressure on everybody, that's maybe a tough spot to be in. But uh, speaking of some of those injuries, we're going to hit on one of those when we get back or one of those injury situations, the X Factor players. We're going to hit on those one of those when we get back. We're going to take a quick break and then come back to talk about everybody's favorite team, not just mine, right? The New York Knickerbockers. So stick around. We'll have some more No Cap Room right after this. Welcome back to No Cap Room. I'm Dan Devine. I'm here with Tom Haberstroh. And I wanted to take an opportunity here to just be very excited about the fact that the big number is appearing on Yahoo Sports right now. One of my favorite video series, sort of a, a long running thing that Tom has been working on. Uh, and the version of it that just went up this week was on the number 20. Can you tell me about why 20 is a big number here, Tom? Because OG Ananobi of the New York Knicks has a positive plus minus in 20 straight games, which is absurd. I could not believe it. Like in the first few games where his like plus minus member, his plus minus was like 34 one night and then 21 the next night. And the Knicks were just rolling teams with OG on the floor. It hasn't stopped. It yeah. really is amazing when you think about it. Um, the record in the last 30 years is 29. So he's approaching just, he's played in only 20 games with the Knicks, Dan. Right, and it's, he's it's been, every one that he's been in is, just, is the craziest part. The team hasn't gone cold and then like, you know, a player gets hurt and then he's, you know, just happens to be on the floor. The other team hasn't gone on this like ridiculous flame run when OG's on the floor. Every single time that OG has been on the floor for the Knicks, they've won. They've won that stint. And what's crazy is, you know, I think we all liked OG An Ananobi coming into this Knicks squad. I don't think we figured out or fathomed how perfect he is in the Tibbs system and that they can throw him on anybody. And he's all defense. We know that he's an incredible player on both ends of the floor. But this week's big number is 20. And by the way, it could be 22. I had this editorial decision, Dan. I actually didn't do 22, but he has done two additional games with the Toronto Raptors before the trade. <laughs> so the um, the uncut version of this week's big number is actually 22, that he's had 22 straight games with a positive plus minus. And I think the the next active high is like seven. That's incredible. And it, you're absolutely right. Like it, it bears out every time you watch him on the floor with the Knicks. He, the degree to which he just sort of bumps everybody else into a role that makes a little more sense for them. Like Josh Hart is a little overtaxed asking him to be like the number one defensive stopper on big wings. Right. So now he doesn't do that. He's been able to play more in the passing lanes where he's incredible, just like Dante DiVincenzo. And that makes the Knicks defense as a whole function so much better, gets them out in transition more often, which maybe in, 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 or in an ideal set of circumstances lightens the load on Jalen Brunson, who's got to do so much shot creation in the half court. The way he's able, uh, able to stretch the floor as a corner shooter opens things up for Brunson and his ISOs and his drives. He, he's such a... like a complimentary star, right? Like it's, so they, the coaches also often talk about stars in their role. Ananobi is that guy because he sort of becomes a force multiplier for everybody else in the rotation and they're, and they're on the, in the lineup when he's out there. 
And that's something that I, I know when I wrote about Julius Randle's uh, season en ending injury last week at Yahoo Sports, that was kind of the, the glass half full look at where it has, it's a damaging injury no matter what, because Randall, when healthy, is the, maybe the best option the Knicks have for surviving offensively in the minutes that Brunson sits. Now, there won't be very many of those come the postseason, but still, if you get blitzed by 10 in four minutes with your number one guy on the bench, that can swing a game and that can swing a series. And the Knicks obviously struggled a lot with that against the Miami Heat in the second round last season. But the goal or the, the glass half full look was if they get Ananobi back healthy, you slot him in at the four, you keep Hart and DiVincenzo on the wing, Brunson, and then whichever of Isaiah Hartenstein or uh, Mitchell Robinson is at the five. And you've got a lineup that makes sense on both ends of the floor and can do some damage. And it's continued to bear out in the numbers. So far, 256 minutes of Brunson and Anunoby together without Randall. The Knicks have outscored teams by 128 points in mm. 256 minutes. I'm not so good at math, but I'm pretty sure that's one over two. So that's why a point every two minutes which would be 24 points in a 48 minute game, which is a blowout win pretty much whenever they've been able to have Ananobi on the court with Brunson. So the hope here is that, you know, the Knicks are able to keep rolling with that. But I think it begs the question, if they're able to sort of keep this rolling, how far do you see the Knicks being able to go in the playoffs, assuming the health of Ananobi's elbow holds up? I think they can get to the East finals um, if that elbow is okay. And that elbow is not okay. Um, like yes. I, I, uh, I remember when it happened, it was, it happened to be a Blazers game when he re aggravated the injury. By the way, yep. is aggravated the right word there or is it re aggravated? I think aggravated if you do it the first time, right? Yeah. Like if, so I mean, it's it's since the surgery, he like aggravated the, the repaired injury. So right. hey, I don't know. Re-aggravated would be uh, redundant. Okay, so he aggravated the injury. Thank you, Dan, <laughs> right. my uh, my English teacher here. Um, <laughs> he aggravated the injury uh, against the Blazers and was like screaming, like he uh, like he audibly yelled, and people in the arena were like, "Oh my god!" Like, take him out of the game. They kept him in, and they just like Tibbs just was like, "Yeah, uh, you're still playing," and he was like laboring on the floor. And any other coach, we'd be like. What are you doing? Like, come on. But then like when it's Tibbs, you're like, yeah, that's, that's just Tibbs. So kind of how he does it, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, and for better or for worse, he, he makes sure that his guys are on the floor um, and to their detriment sometimes. And then, you know, he had to miss some more time. Um, and OG uh, is, is one of these players that like, again, like Drew Holiday, Andre Godala, that they're miscast as like a 25 point scorer or the lead guy. But if you have him as your like number three, um, he's awesome. And if his elbow is not working, that's that's a problem because of those corner threes. You need him to be hitting at a, at a league average right there just to give that extra space on those Jalen drives. And the other thing here is um, very important journalism here. Um, I was thinking... Does OG stand for only gains? <laughs> it certainly seems to be to 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 make sense. I mean, the team do, is only gaining on the opposition when he's on the floor. Only gains. So, I like I like it. Um, I I threw it out there in the big number video, which you can catch on Yahoo Sports NBA. I'm proud of it, and also not proud of it. <laughs> only I understand gains. that feeling. I mean, also he's like swole is all get out. I mean, you certainly hope the elbow is not swollen, but broadly, <laughs> he's, an, he's an extraordinarily strong gentleman. And so, yeah, he's, he's certainly experiencing nothing but gains on the floor. I think you're, you're right to, to point at that Eastern finals as a, it's an aspirational goal, but it's not necessarily crazy, right? Like the Knicks, as it stands right now, they're most likely to finish third. I mean, projection models have them finish in third. That would mean, you know, obviously a lot of furniture moving around in that middle pack of the East, but if they wind up in three six against, say, the Pacers, right? That Take Indiana team, that Indiana team can be really dangerous with a healthy Tyrese Halliburton. He has not been particularly healthy the last couple of months since the hamstring injury that he had. Although his shooting has be begun to tick up more the last like 10, 12 games, so you know you got you got to deal with a, a dangerous opponent there. And your you know your worry in that matchup is. Oh my goodness, it's a repeat of Trey Young dicing us up. You know, pick and roll ball handler who can pull up from wherever, slicing and dicing us. And, uh, you know, the Knicks wind up in a disappointing round one upset. And the, 
you know, more optimistic view since I've got light coming from behind me. We're going to be optimistic moving forward. Lightning bolts coming out of your uh, ass as That's well exactly as right. thunder. Yeah, exactly right. Um, which is <laughs> deeply uncomfortable for everybody. No, I mean, not least of all me, since I'm there. The, I'm the one they're coming. You're out the of. one who said it. I'm not I know. Little... I and and Frank, I, yeah, as you said, I'm proud of it and I'm ashamed of it at the same time. <laughs> um, but that Knicks team was entirely different than this Knicks team, right? Like the yeah. only player likely to play meaningful minutes from that team on this roster would be Mitchell Robinson because Randall's out. Alec Burks had his interregnum moving to Detroit and then coming back. And if he plays meaningful minutes, Tom Thibodeau and I need to have a conversation. Um, but the that Knicks team did not have Jalen Brunson. That Knicks team did not have OG Ananobi or Josh Hart or Dr. DiVincenzo, a much stronger overall quality of squadron. So the idea is like, you put that team, the Knicks would be favored in that series, whether, you know, wh whatever the situation would be. You say they get that series. If you win that series, you move into round two and you're dealing with a perhaps injury mitigated Giannis Antetokounmpo in round two. Or mm -hmm. if a seven seed out of the play in knocks off Milwaukee in round one, which I think we have to at least consider inside the realm of possibilities here, then you're within striking distance of the, of the conference finals, right? Like that's not outside the realm of, of possible outcomes for the Knicks. And I don't know. I think that was considered like a high end pie in the sky, maybe outcome start of the season and that we are now in the last couple of games of the season here. Uh, and that is maybe within realistic grasp, I think speaks to the significant impact that Adonobi has had since his arrival. Yeah. And, and it really is important to note that like Julius Randall uh, on paper and what he brings to the team is valuable. Um, but what he takes away from the team defensively in those in those postseason matchups um, and some of his decision making can be problematic in big moments. But um, OG and Anobi sliding over to the four, and then you have Josh Hart at the three and Divincenzo at the two. Like I, I feel really confident with that with that unit as long as they can score. Like Jalen Brunson, if he somehow doesn't have it or the the whistle isn't going his way. Um, in the playoffs, it's going to get really ugly if they get some more, you know, if, if OG can kind of take that next level and be able to create efficient looks for his teammates, um, then you don't miss Julius Randle as much. And I, when the injury happened, same thing I felt with Carl Anthony Towns. The backups for that player, in some ways, there's going to be some Ewing theory uh, potential with Julius Randle and Carl Anthony Towns, as we saw with Nas Reed. It's just like, Man, they're not losing all that much without right. that star player. Not to say that he's not a star, but they're complementary players that elevate their roles in place of that star player. I actually think this Knicks team, if they're healthy, I have more confidence in them without Julius Randle than with them. And and maybe that's just more my confidence in OG and Josh Hart getting those minutes than if they were having to like cede that to Julius Randle. But I don't know where you're at on the Julius Randle experience. I think he's a, gr a good offensive player, a star. But with this team in the playoffs, making it 90s basketball, like grinding it out, uh, I kind of feel like this formation might be their best chance. There's a definite, I mean, it's a reasonable argument, especially if the idea is you are redistributing a lot of those touches and that usage to Brunson, who is just like flat out a more efficient player and somebody that I think you've got a lot more confidence in shot creation in a postseason environment than Randall. And one of the things, and this makes for a, a neat transition here, one of the biggest bummers for me about the Randall situation, I talked about it last week on the show, is this was going to be an opportunity for him to kind of rewrite the story in the postseason after a couple mm. of disappointing outings for him. He was a player that profiled as having a lot on the line heading into this postseason. He's not going to get the opportunity to, to have that chance to rewrite the story. There are some players, though, that are going to that have an awful lot on the line as they head into the series, into the postseason here, whether that's a lot to gain, a lot to lose reputationally, a lot to lose financially. You know, there's a, a lot to, to consider here. And with the playoffs right around the corner and uh, the, these sort of significant impact hanging over players, coaches and teams, um, wanted to talk a little bit about so who some of those players were that we think are maybe have the most on the line in the postseason. So, uh, Tom, why don't you get us started? Who to you is somebody that has an awful lot uh, on the line riding on this postseason? The number one guy on my list is Jason Tatum. Um, Jason Tatum, to me, is kind of in this zone right now where we don't really know how good he is. 
We don't, even though we've seen him in the playoffs so many times. And I think through his career, um, he's played uh, how many seasons now is it? Like he's, uh, let's see here. It's seven, seven seasons. Yeah. And every season he's, uh, ex- with the exception one, well, this one he hasn't had his postseason yet. He's been in the playoffs every single season of his career. And we still kind of feel like, okay, is he the number one on a championship team? Right. We don't know that. And whether that's a, a, a fake concept, like the idea of being a number one on a championship team, we kind of feel like with the, the chips onto the table right now, the Boston Celtics are the favorite. They're about to win, what, 65 games this season? And he's not an MVP. He's not in the MVP conversation. Um, but I feel like with his crunch time woes in the playoffs the last few years, that is really the only thing standing between them and a championship, in my opinion, is I think they roll against the Miami Heat the last couple of years if they get some really strong play out of Jason Tatum in in those big moments. And clutch can be very fi- fi- uh, fickle. You know, like we, I laugh at like Skip Bayless and the whole idea of a clutch gene. I'm not right. trying to say that. He doesn't have the clutch gene, even though two big numbers ago, I pointed out that his efficiency in big moments uh, is some of the worst over the last three seasons, regular season and postseason compared to his like, you know, all NBA peers. And Jalen Brown is actually way more efficient. So if you haven't checked that out, the big numbers debut a couple weeks ago, got a lot of flack from the 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 New England contingency. Which no, is, they're, nor- they're normally... It. They're normally pretty nuanced and 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 chill about that kind of co- co- you know conception of their players. I, I was kind of surprised by that. Yeah, uh, very surprised uh, about Boston in that sense. Uh, they're usually you know as soon they're 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 really campaigning for Marcus Smart as like the greatest defender in the NBA, and then when he, they get Drew Holiday, they're like, wait, no, 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 no. <laughs> love this guy Drew. Like, love. Let's sign him to an extension. By the way, we didn't really talk about that whole aspect of like the Drew Holiday extension. Is like, do do they still prefer, you know, Marcus Smart, the Defensive Player of the Year award winner, a couple years ago? Which I laughed at that when it happened, and now it, I, I don't know. He, he had a tough year injury wise. This is a detour. Jason Tatum is number one on my list. Sure, <laughs> uh, it's a completely valid pick. Um, I mean, yeah, you know, this the the. the reputational stakes like this team has everything it needs right like they the Celtics enter Thursday with the fifth largest average margin of victory ever according to Stathead right yeah the four the four teams ahead of them all won the title and those teams are all like Mount Rushmore type teams the 72 Lakers that won 33 straight the Kareem and Oscar 71 bucks the 72 win 96 Bulls and the first year of Durant on the Warriors. Those are the only teams that have a, they have a better point differential to this point than these Celtics. They're going to have home court advo- advantage in every series they play. The Celtics, as you mentioned, ev- the playoffs every year of Tatum's career, more postseason wins than anybody but the Warriors in this in that that span in Tatum's career. They've done everything but win a title. And so this is it. This is what's left. And the organization has put everything around Tatum and the Tatum Brown core to put it in position to finally reach the top of that particular mountain. And there's a million reasons why maybe they don't get there, right? Like the reality, and as you mentioned with the so the way that Tatum's evaluated compared to his peers is like, He's just not quite at that level. Like he's he's in the M- in the MVP conversation to the extent that it is is he is he fifth? That is the com- the place yeah. in the conversation he occupies because he's. I think most observers look at it and say, in terms of just like individual ability or individual production, he is not at the level of Giannis Antetokounmpo. He's not at the level of of Nikola Jokic. He's not at the level of Luka Doncic, Shade Gildas Alexander. You know, insert players here. Joel Embiid. He has had more success collectively than almost all those guys, except for Jokic, obviously. But and maybe some of that, you know, Ben Golliver, our old buddy, mentioned this on Divine Intervention on Tuesday. Like Tatum deserves some credit for pulling back to make more space for all these other guys to play to the level that they have um, and sort of take the reins of the team in that way. But when, you know, rubber meets the road in these these, you know, late season games in these biggest moments of the season, those guys have been the ones to elevate their teams. And Tatum has yet to do that. With the exceptions, and they're re- like significant real exceptions of 
46 in game six in Milwaukee, yeah. right? In 2022 and 51 in game seven against the Sixers last year. Like he's been, he's done that in playoff games, just not at the championship level. And so for him to be in that set of circumstances, like th- everything will be judged by that. You're absolutely right. Like a wonderful season, historic regular season, you know, ask how that went for Rudy Gobert and Donovan Mitchell in Salt Lake City, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. That that without a conference finals or a finals or a title like doesn't get you too far. So um, Tatum is a, is a huge one on that list. Um, for me, I want to go. I'm going to zag a little bit because I know we've got it. We share some some folks on our list. Um, basically, like, I just mentioned Donovan Mitchell, the Cavs big four. Um, mm. This is like there's reasons, there's explanations for why Cleveland has struggled the last month. The, the biggest one is. Donovan Mitchell's missed 15 games since the beginning of March, right? He's had injuries, you know, the uh, bone bruise, I believe, in the left knee that needed uh, PRP treatment, broke his nose, you know, friendly fire on a rebound. Like, he's been out of the lineup. He's their number one guy. They're going to struggle. I understand that. But the specifics and the context surrounding that team, they looked great when it was Mitchell and Jared Allen. They've looked great when it's Darius Garland and Evan Mobley. They've looked eh when all four guys are together. And they went from, I think it was 26 and eight uh, in 34 games heading into the All-Star break to 11 and 17 since it. Mm-hmm. And now they're in a position again where they, I mean, they could finish as high as second, they could drop down. If they go into the first round and get punched in the mouth again, it just feels like a distinct possibility. Like I have like some real, uh, there's gotta be some deja vu vibes about like if they draw Orlando in the first round and it's like, Welcome to a team that's just going to beat the hell out of you for, you know, as long as a series lasts and then see if you are up for it or not. If they get punched in the mouth again and they don't walk through it and survive round one, I you kind of feel like management's got to look at the construction of it, right? And wonder, yeah. like, is this is this what we want to build everything around? And that's a, that's a tough place to be, given how successful in the regular season they've been these past couple of seasons, how optimistic everyone has, you know, was even two months ago. Um, that's a tough spot to be in right now, but I think it's the spot that they are in. Yeah, and it, and it r- great pick there. Um, and I think J.B. Bickerstaff in there, too, is that he's, I think, a really great coach. Um, but w- if you can't get those four players to perform at their optimal state and win with that kind of talent under your roof... Uh, it feels like everything could be on the table for this team. And Dan Gilbert coming out and saying, "Yeah, we're gonna sign, we're gonna sign this dude to an extension." And Donovan Mitchell's like, eh, "You know what? Uh, <laughs> no comment on that." Feels like there's a lot of weight on these guys' shoulders. And like to your point, like they could prove everyone wrong and be like, "Yeah, we're gonna make a run to the Eastern Conference Finals here," and and put all of those concerns uh, to rest. Another team in the East here, we've got Jason Tatum and then the, basically the Cavs' big four. I will throw out Damian Lillard as another Absolutely. one. Not just be, like, I feel like the Giannis injury lets him off the hook a little bit. But the trade demand out of Portland, then going to Milwaukee, then Adrian Griffin gets fired. It's, the blood isn't on Damian Lillard's hands. But I think when you look at the fact that he doesn't have a championship, but Giannis does, they trade Drew Holiday, who won a championship with the team. Um, They bring in Doc Rivers to kind of fix this thing. And then now Giannis gets hurt. And that's the thing where it kind of, I think, gives Damian Lillard a little bit of, dials down the temperature a little bit on Damian Lillard. Because if they flame out in the first or second round, I think you can realistically imagine that a lot of that will be due to Giannis's calf strain, whether he comes back and he's not himself or he doesn't come back and it's just, it's the Dame Bobby Portis show and it just doesn't, it doesn't hit the same way. It, if this was, if, if Giannis wasn't hurt, Dan, would you put him above Jason Tatum on your list? Dame, yeah, I mean, because you're absolutely, I mean, the thing that you highlighted, he does not have the pelts on the wall, right? Like every, even Doc, right? Like Doc Rivers, I know you you had written at the at the Finder a couple months ago, like about the uh, perception of Doc Rivers versus the reality and like the way that he's talked about his reputational, the the game of tennis about whether he's like over-respected or under-respected uh, is an interesting one given his, his resume. But 
Doc has won a title and has led teams deep into the playoffs. Giannis has won a title. All of the core, other core guys in Milwaukee have all won it. Dame's the one coming to the party a little light. And the whole point was our offense, especially in the half court and especially in crunch time, dies too often late in these games. You are the band-aid for that. You are the tourniquet for that wound. And it's been up and down kind of all season. And so it hasn't looked exactly the way we expected it to on the box, right? It hasn't matched the picture that you got in the store. And if they fall short and it continues to look roughly the way it has during the regular season, a little fits and startsy, the streaky shooting, all that kind of stuff, then yeah, I think Dame wears that to a different degree because he's the you know, like last guy in the door, uh, fairly or unfairly. So I, I think you're right to note the temperature goes down a little bit. Everyone's expectations get ratcheted down when your best guy is, uh, you know, uh, hobbled to some degree again. And we'll, it remains to be seen how much that will be, you know, the severity of the strain. Uh, I know our guy, um, uh, Jeff Stotts at in street clothes had suggested like the average length of time for uh, an exit for, or duration of, of uh, an injury for this, usually about like two and a half weeks. That, you know, maybe he's back in the middle of the first round remains to be seen. We'll see, you know, and and in what form he is when he comes back, how explosive he can be, all that kind of stuff. But um, if they the the flip side of it is if and I know Dame Dame has had some really big games this season when Giannis has been out. If Giannis is out or Giannis is limited and Dame goes nuts and they carry them. Yep. Yeah, they do win a series. They do win two series. They get to a conference finals. Two conference finals on your resume looks a lot different than one, and the co- the circumstances in which he would be elevating them, I think, uh, burnish his bona fides a little bit. Yeah. Um, so I, I think that's that's a, a good choice. I'm going to go to the West for my next one here. Who did Zion Williamson last play in a postseason game? Uh, wow. It was. It, did he play in the tournament at Duke? Michigan State. Yeah. The last time that he played in a postseason game was the Elite Eight against Michigan State five years ago. Yeah, he has he has never played. He didn't play in the play in with the with the uh, the Pelicans. He has not played in a playoff series. And so there's a a question still, you know, their seating is very much up in the air uh, in the West right now. So we don't know for sure if he's going to even be in a playoff series. But man, Zion, this is it. Hey, Zion. You've you've done what you can do your level best this season to kind of rehabilitate the reputation of like, well, he never plays. He gets he got paid all this money, but he's always off the floor. Yep. You know, the the way that he got sort of dragged through the mud after the the disappointing showing in the in-season tournament game against the Lakers. And it became a referendum on his fitness and his health and all those sorts of things. He has played more. He played 65 games for the first time in his career. He has gotten better and looked at leaner and more explosive as the season has gone on. Assist rates up. The efficiency has been really good. I think the last like 15 games or so, up over 25, 26 points a game, 620 true shooting. The Again, assist rates up. He's looking like the all-NBA game breaker that we've seen. There's a, that huge game against the Suns where he's on the floor with Bradley Beal and Kevin Durant and De- Devin Booker, and he looks like the best guy on the floor against those guys in a game they needed. This is it. If you would like, I mean, think about, you have to cast our mind back because it's been so long. All of the hype that attended Zion Williamson, all, all of the, this is a transformational prospect, generational talent, all that kind of stuff coming out of Duke, coming into New Orleans with the number one overall pick. And we have yet to see him in a playoff series. If we, if he can perform at that level, I, you, you, yeah, all the stuff that I mentioned about Boncaro earlier, where it's like, you find out how teams defend you and then what you have as counters, how you deal with it. This Pelicans team is deep. There's interesting pieces on it. It never seems to come together at the same time. Brandon Ingram being hurt is a problem for that. Uh, The perpetual sort of will they, won't they usage of Jonas Valanciunas is an issue, all that kind of stuff. But this is the time to find out what Zion looks like in this context. And if if even a loss, if they come in as an underdog against, a, you know, they're, they're in the three six and they're dealing with Oklahoma City, who's been fantastic on both ends of the floor since Jump Street, MVP candidates and the two clutch closers with SGA and Jalen Williams. If they lose that series, I don't think that's necessarily any skin off their nose. And maybe or, or, so the issue is like if you can perform in that series, like, say, Luca did in the series where they lost to the Clippers and you're a monster and everyone sees it, but you just you're outgunned. That elevates Zion reputationally, I think, in a way that 
He's got, but he's got to show it. He's got to be in those in those games. He's got to perform at that level. I think he's capable of it, and I think we've seen that over the course of the season. I've been in the tank for this Pelicans team in a way that's going to break my heart, and I know it. <laughs> but this is it. Like you're here, you're on the doorstep. You know, let's see it, Zion. Yeah, and uh, it reminds me like a couple years ago when they played against the Suns in the first round. That was an awesome series, and uh, they didn't have Zion. Yeah, he was uh, watching the his street clothes. And it feels like, you know, um, if they have the same ceiling this year as they did without him, um, it'll raise questions about that that idea of Zion Williamson as being the alpha on this team. Like, is he the number one that you can bank around? But then you got the Brandon Ingram in- injury here that is kind of, again, another question mark of another variable that will give, I think, those who are in Zion's corner a little bit of an out that is like, you know what? If Brandon Ingram's healthy, this is a different team. Um, so I, I almost feel like they need to put him in bubble wrap, Zion, for the next like three games because <laughs> we can't not have Zion playoff Zion. Like, we need playoff yeah, we Zion. we need it. We need it in the worst way. And he, you can tell that Zion wants that. Like he wants that stage. Um, and so I, I'm, I'm rooting for that. Two guys I'm going to throw at you. Two of the best players in the league that have never won a championship or have tons of accolades, but not the championship ring, James Harden and Rudy Gobert. I'm not saying Rudy mm. Gobert is the same level in the pantheon of NBA players as uh, as James Harden, but he's he's got four Defensive Player of the Year awards, and the questions continue to you know circle around him. The vultures about his uh, legacy about like great defensive player in the regular season, but liability in the postseason, And that's unfair in most cases. Um, but you do see uh, this Minnesota Timberwolves team in the same way that the Boston Celtics, where we build you up to tear you down. Yeah. The Minnesota Timberwolves could nail that number one seed. And then the expectations are, you know, in the P Flans thing, it's like, it's way more fun when Ant Edwards and, and Nas Reed are, you know, on the ascent rather than yep. arrived because then the expectations for Rudy Gobert and Carl Anthony Towns and that injury is so awkward because of how well they played without him uh, with Nas Reed's ascension. It's going to be really tough if like they decide, Hey, you know what, Rudy, we need cat and Nas Reed out there. We've got to, we got to get more scoring out there. And they're not able to attack mismatches or switches or when teams go small that's the thing is you're going to hear those Rudy Gobert questions too. And then on the other side, James Harden, we, we don't have to spend too much time on that, but like the Clippers <laughs> and their move to uh Balmer may a Balmer dome. Like it feels like there's a lot at stake with just about everyone on that Clippers team and James Harden and the, you know, how many times has he forced a trade out of his situation? It seems like, the heat isn't really not Miami heat, but like the heat is turned down on that whole sure. storyline, but man feels like that is a big, big part of this too. Absolutely. I mean, if, if nothing else, because it brings back one of the greatest quotes, I mean, I guess one of the greatest quotes of all time, non toilet hands division, um, is just KG being like, you ain't got no infinite wiggles. Like at a certain point, uh, James Harden's going to be out of wiggles and this might be it. So if, if you, you know, flame out again in the playoffs, uh, you know, what, the the bag that's waiting for you, it seems like the only place that it's waiting is in L.A. And then if that becomes untenable, yeah, you know, where do you go from there? I'll, another one on that list, Paul George, just like uh, go quickly with it. He has the opportunity to be the bell of the ball and unrestricted free agency. He can opt out of the mm-hmm. final year of his deal. He's the old like Kawhi extended. And then he was like, I think everybody's going to be back. And Paul George is kind of like, yeah, I don't know. We'll see about that. Kawhi took less than the max. Does PG not want to do that? Um, how he performs in the postseason, does that impact say, hypothetically, I don't know, Daryl Morey's willingness to throw the entire full four-year bag at him, uh, TBD, remains to be seen. And Gobert, one note on that, I just wanted to highlight because it was coming off of the Wednesday game against the Nuggets where they're in it right up until the last like six minutes or so, and then Denver absolutely hits the afterburners, scores on like 10 straight trips, and that's the game. The the, the Nuggets were basically doing their postseason rotation in terms of your backup center is Aaron Gordon. So they're playing small against huge Rudy Gobert, right? Beginning of the second quarter, beginning of the fourth quarter. And they're switching everything, which is the way that Denver likes to play in this postseason context. And so after the games, quote, courtesy of our friend Dane Moore uh, with Blue Wire Podcast, 
Rudy Gobert saying that the Wolves need to be better at beating switches when an opponent plays small against them. Quote, I think we didn't take advantage of the small lineup. They were switching everything. They were switching small guys on me and Nas and we took tough shots. I think we have some work to do as a team. We have to prepare for that. Not for nothing. Dun, we heard dun, an dun. awful lot of that the entire time that he was in uh, Utah. And every time the ball got down to him, it didn't like they didn't regularly beat it. So maybe that's a ecosystem thing. Maybe that's a can we deliver you the ball in the right place thing. It's just that perked my ears up a little bit because I'm like, uh oh, we've heard this exact same thing before heading into postseason series where teams want to play small against you. And the antidote to that is you need to mash them. And if you're like at game 80 and you don't have that in the bag yet, that might be uh, something to keep an eye on uh, as, as they head into this postseason. But uh, you're absolutely, I mean, great, great choices, plenty on the line, uh, plenty to keep an eye on as we head into the postseason because guys, that's about all we got for you today. I think that was plenty. I mean, frankly, just the Mark Aguirre section alone was enough, let alone everything else that we've given to you. Um, Tom, before we get out the door, anything that you'd like to plug on your way out? Uh, yeah, check out that big number um, on OGN and Obi, and that will be weekly at Yahoo Sports uh, coming out on Thursdays. So we've got three, I think, in the in the vault right now. So we got OG, uh, and we have Jason Tatum. Um, and then last week we had another one. So we've got three in the in the vault. So go check them all out. They will be on social media. I will be tweeting them out, but also on yahoosports.com uh, on the NBA section. You will get the big number videos. Uh, and I'm believe it or not, I will be writing for Yahoo Sports as well. I am working on a, a, a piece right now that um, I'm very excited about. And uh, so just keep an eye out that uh, you will be seeing me and this mug uh, and hopefully more references to toilet hands in the future at Yahoo. Incredible. I cannot wait. I'm thrilled about it. I mean, you know this and we've talked about it before. I'm a gigantic fan of your work and have been for forever and a fan of you. So being able to share a roof with you a little bit is a true treat for me. Um, it's my pleasure. I will just say it is the pleasure is all mine. Uh, it, it, Dan, you are the man. Um, and I think when uh, when I when I find out that I'm going to be potting with you, I get really excited because I can bring up toilet hands. <laughs> And I knowing my insist. audience will it, enjoy this um, because you just have that way about you, Dan, um, that, that that flicker in the eye that that makes me excited to talk about NBA in a in a in a time where the NBA, you know, can beat you down and spit you out um, yes. and the hours are long um, that we do sit here and laugh about toilet hands or Elephant drawers, elephant drawers, laundry bag. Oh man, I got, I feel like I'm going to go back as soon as we're done with this. I'm going to go back and re listen to the audio just to dive deep into those names again. But in order to do that, we got to get out of here. So that's all we got for you today, everybody. Thanks so much to super producer John Gennaro for all of the things that he does to make the show look and sound great. Subscribe to Ball Don't Lie on YouTube or whatever podcast platform you are currently listening. And please leave us a five-star review. Share the show. Helps us with discoverability. Uh, every little bit helps. Um, thanks so much for listening. And we would appreciate it if you would come back again next week for another episode of No Catherine.